All right, chapter eight. Gift for the darkness, okay? So yesterday we covered the first three questions, so I'm just going to review those just so we have, you can see the answers and make sure that we have a discussion about those things. Um, so number one we talked about yesterday was in this beginning of the scene, who calls the meeting and what happens? You guys told me that Jack calls the meeting. Um, on 125, he blows the conch, brings the boys together, and at the bottom of 125, he starts a speech. And in this speech, he basically puts this to the group one more time and tries to call Ralph out as not being a proper leader, calling him a coward, and puts it to a vote again. Who thinks Ralph ought to be chief? And he waits expectantly for the boys to raise their hands and vote that Ralph should step down, and in fact, they do not. So they all stand there sort of in silence. And for the second time, we see Jack shot down. This time he cries. He's really upset by the fact that no one votes for him. And because he's so humiliated, we see at the bottom of page 127, he decides to leave the group. So crying, he runs into the jungle and says that he's going off on his own. When he does say that, he uses an interesting choice of word, which is the word play. And we highlighted this. This was on page 127 where he says, I'm not going to be part of Ralph's lot. I'm not going to play any longer, not with you. And yesterday we talked about the use of the word play and what that tells us. And you guys gave me two interesting answers. You said, first of all, it reminds us that the boys are boys, they're kids, they're little, and that they're just, you know, child, are just children. And the second thing you said was that the use of the word play really does indicate to us what Jack's feeling um, is of what this time on the island has been. So his, in his perspective, all of this time has been fun and games. It has been play. It's not really about survival, which is what Ralph has been trying to get them to understand. Then we moved uh, into um, 128 and 129, which is where Jack has clearly left. And um, the boys that are left on the beach are sort of feeling uneasy. They really don't know how to take all of this, especially Ralph. And so on 128 and 129, um, he is feeling sort of indecisive. And he's thinking that they can no longer have a fire and they'll never get rescued. And on 129, you guys showed me that Piggy sort of steps in. And on 129, he says, like, we got no fire on the mountain, but what's wrong with a fire down here? A fire could be built on those rocks, on the sand even. We'd make smoke just the same. So did we get that highlight on 129? Just check for me. Yes? yes? Okay. So he suggests we'll move the fire to the beach and it'll be better. And if you know, we can have a fire right here and it, the smoke won't go as high, but it's still going to be a signal. So Piggy feels the need that he, he needs to get, you know, Ralph back on track thinking of the right things, okay? So that brings us to 130 and 131. And on page 131 especially, as they um, decide that they're gonna build this little fire on the beach, all the boys scatter to go get wood. And so on 131, when they all come back together, Ralph was looking around and he realizes that there are people missing. Did you, did you catch on to that? Right, he's like, where's Roger, and where's Maurice, and where's Robert? And he realizes that boys are, are not there. And so what does Piggy say is the reason why they can't find these boys? His guess is what? Yeah, he says, I suppose they won't, won't want to play any longer either, and they've went with him. And so we assume that these boys, especially the ones that were in the choir, probably went and a lot, you know, and joined Jack's group, and so that we do find them in the jungle. And so that's 131. Now, Ralph's bothered by this, that those boys have left, but he's actually really bothered by one particular boy who's missing, and this is on page 132. So do we go to page 132? I don't know if we had a highlight there. Did we get anything there yet? Okay, so on 132, what does Ralph say that he's most concerned about? Who is missing? Who is missing, Kyle? Simon. Yes, and what does Ralph say? What does he think he might be doing? It's like right here. Do you see it? Oh, I, I, I think you're calling someone else. No, I'm talking to you. 
Oh, uh, what says Ralph remembered what had been worrying him? Yes. Him. Where's Simon? Yes. I don't know. Yes. You don't think he's climbing the mountain? There you go. So let's highlight that. So I'm right here. Ralph remembered what had been worrying him. And he asks, where's Simon? And Piggy says, I don't know. And then Ralph says, you don't think he's climbing the mountain, do you? Okay, so we actually know as readers where he is based on this next paragraph. So when we shift scenes and we go to Simon's scene, he is where? He's in that like little jungle spot. Yeah, his little hiding spot in the jungle. And so it's right here at the bottom of 132. It says Simon had passed through the area of fruit trees, but today the little ones had been too busy with the fire on the beach and they had not pursued him there. He went on among the creepers until he reached the great mat that was woven by the open space and crawled inside. Beyond the screen of leaves, the sunlight pelted down and the butterflies danced. In the middle, their unending dance. And we told you every time those butterflies are mentioned, you know where he is, right? And so now he's just sitting in there and the sun is beating down on him and he's becoming very, very thirsty. He's sweating profusely. And if you look at the top of 133, all we highlighted was presently he was thirsty and then very thirsty, he continued to sit. And that's probably one of the reasons why he ends up going into the seizure is because he's so dehydrated. So that clue we highlighted because he's just not doing anything, he's just sitting there, okay? And then on 133, the scene shifts again, correct? And we now join Jack and his group, okay? And it says, far off along the beach, Jack was standing before a small group of boys and he looked brilliantly happy. And he's like, hunting! And he looks over all of the boys and they're wearing black caps, which lets us know that they are his choir boys. And he says, we'll hunt and I'm going to be chief. And the boys standing in front of him nod. So on page 133, he finally gets what he's always wanted since he's arrived on the island. He is in control of his own group. And so he tells them, and the beast, I say this, we aren't going to bother about the beast. We're going to forget about the beast, right? And he's telling all the boys what they're going to do. And number four says, describe some of Jack's plans for his new tribe. And actually the answer to number four comes in one single, one single paragraph. And it's going to be down here with the paragraph that starts, now listen. Can you find that paragraph? Page 133, below the halfway point, it's a paragraph that starts, now listen. Highlight the whole thing. And as you highlight it, read what it says and tell me what three things does he want his group to do. And this will be your answer for number four. So what's the first thing he says? First thing? Okay, so that's not the first oh. thing, but that's one of the things. Oh. They're going to kill a pig and give a feast. And they don't have to be in order. That's fine. Vivian? Get some of the biggest, like the con. Yes, which is very sneaky. He wants to try to get as many of the big boys away from the cock and all that. Meaning, I'm trying to get him away from Ralph. So he's by himself. Really? That's the one that most people mess with. Yeah. Answer. And what's the third thing? Taking as many boys as he can, killing a pig and giving a feast, and then he's going to do what? Leave some of them. Yes, we're going to leave some of our kill for the beast. Which is kind of strange because didn't he just say, we're going to forget about the beast? Right? He just said that, like three lines above. And then he's saying that they're going to give part of their, their kill to the beast as sort of a, what would you say? Offering. An offering, like a sacrifice. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So then on the bottom of page 133, they spread out and they're going to go on the hunt. Okay. So now, question five. How does the author make you, the reader, sympathetic about the death of the sow? And why is this significant? This question, guys, is really what your quiz question was yesterday. It was just sort of worded in a different way. So if you remember, your quiz question yesterday was, which pig does he choose out of all of the pigs that are there? He has a large selection. And then the choice he makes shows him to be both savage, highly savage, and yet a coward at the same time. So 
That really should answer number five, too. Elliot, want to give it a try? Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, go ahead. He chose like the sow because it had big lips, so it was weak. And then that savage because it was a hobby. Yeah, and it shows him ca that he's a coward because why? Because it was weak and it was a big hobby. Yeah, so you hear what he said? He said he picks out of all the pigs that are there a new mother who's very large. In fact, she was the largest pig there, which as a hunter, makes them smart, right? Because as a hunter, you want to get the most meat that you can, and so that's smart. But it's highly savage because she's a brand new mother, her babies are with her, and like you said, she's probably going to be an easy target, right? Because she's bigger, she's weak, she's off guard, she's not really you know, focused on anything other than these babies, and so he does pick the easy target, okay? So, um, Okay, so let's start on 134 and just get your highlighter ready. <clears throat> We're going to try to save our highlighter's life because there's a lot of highlighting and I don't want you to like. So first of all, on 134, the very first paragraph, you're going to put a box around that. Okay, just put a big box around that first paragraph. That way that will keep you from having to highlight every single line. But in that paragraph, could you please highlight the first phrases? Like, I want you to highlight the pigs lay bloated bags of fat. Okay, because that phrase is going to be important later in the book. So I want you to be able to go, go back to it. Okay, so it says, The pigs lay bloated bags of fat, sensuously enjoying the shadows under the trees. There was no wind, and they were unsuspicious. And practice had made Jack silent as the shadows. He stole away again and instructed his hidden hunters. Presently, they all began to inch forward, sweating in the silence and heat. And under the trees and ears, flapped idly. And this part of the paragraph is the most important. It says, a little apart from the rest, sunk in deep maternal bliss, lay the largest sow of the lot. So in your answer, you wanted it was a sow and that she was the biggest. Okay? And it says she was black and pink and the great bladder of her belly was fringed with a row of piglets that slept or burrowed or squeaked. So you had to say something in your answer about her having babies or having piglets, okay? Some people said she was pregnant, and that's not accurate. So that was wrong, okay? Then it says, 15 yards away from the drove, Jack stopped, his arm straightening, pointed at the saddle. He looked around in inquiry to make sure that everyone understood and the boys nodded. The row of right arms slid back. Now, the drove of pigs started up, and at a range of only 10 yards, the wooden spears with fire-hardened points flew towards the chosen pig. One piglet with a demented shriek rushed into the sea, trailing Roger's spear behind it. The sow gave a gasping squeal and staggered up, with two spears sticking in her fat flank. The boy shouted and rushed forward. The piglets scattered and the sow burst the advancing line and went crashing away through the forest. After her, they raced along the pig track, but the forest was too dark and tangled so that Jack, cursing, stopped them and cast among the trees. Then he said nothing for a time, but breathed fiercely so that they were awed by him and looked at each other in an uneasy admiration. Presently, he stabbed down at the ground with his finger. There. And before the others could even examine the drop of blood, Jack had swerved off, judging a trace, touching a bow that gave. And so he followed, mysteriously right and assured, and the hunters trod behind him. He stopped before a covert in there. 135. They surrounded the covert, but the sow got away with the sting of another spear in her flank. The trailing butts hindered her, and the sharp cross-cut points were a torment. She blundered into a tree, forcing a spear still deeper, and after that, any of the hunters could follow her easily by the drops of vivid blood. And we're gonna start a highlight right here. So hopefully you were with me. Starting with, the afternoon, the afternoon wore on, hazy and dreadful with damp heat. The sow staggered her way ahead of them, bleeding and mad, and the hunters followed, wedded to her in lust, excited by the long chase and the dropped blood pause there. They could see her now, nearly got up with her, but she spurted again with her last strength and held ahead of them. And then you're going to do one more highlight. 
highlight. They were just behind her when she staggered into an open space where bright flowers grew and butterflies danced around each other. Did you pick up on that? Okay, so they're chasing her and when she finally collapses to the point where they can get to her, she is literally right in the opening in front of Simon's hiding spot. So now he is going to have a front row seat to all of this violence that's going to unfold. And you know that he doesn't like that kind of stuff. He doesn't like the killing. And there's nowhere for him to go. They don't know he's there, but he can see them. Question. Um, isn't that foreshadowing because the pig dies in there and so then maybe something will happen to so There's a lot of foreshadowing. There's also a storm brewing. Did you see the description of the clouds that were coming towards the island? And we know that we've read enough literature that a storm always means something bad is going to happen. So yeah, okay. So now, this next paragraph, again, for the sake of your highlighter's life, just put a giant box around the middle paragraph on 135. Yeah, the here struck down by the heat. We're gonna put a big box around that, okay. Okay, so now, the, now did anybody read the back of the book, the uh, the commentary in the back, like the afterword? Did anybody read that? So there's this list. There's an afterword um, right here, okay, and it's a commentary by another author who's talking about the book. And I just asked that because there's a couple of interesting things that she talks about that a couple of um, students read, and then they asked me some questions about, and it had to do with this scene. Okay, so this paragraph right here that we're about to read, where they actually end the pig's life, is a paragraph that critics will argue is written like a rape scene. Okay, and I say that because if you really study the word choice, you're looking at, if you think of that, you're looking at like one entity imposing itself on another entity without consent, and that's sort of what that, that means. And if you look at the, what the boys do, there's a lot of phrasing and word choice that alludes to that. Okay, and it's like a really mature topic for eighth grade, and that's why the book tends to be read, read in an older grade. Um, but when you read the scene, that's sort of what critics will liken it to. So if you read the afterword, she touches on that. If you read stuff online, you may see that in commentary, okay? So it says, here struck down by the heat, the south fell, and the hunters hurled themselves at her. And that phrasing right there has that sort of tone it says, this dreadful eruption from an unknown world made her frantic. She squealed and bucked, meaning tried to get them off of her. And it says, and the air was full of sweat and noise and blood and terror. Now, I want you to look carefully at what each boy is doing, okay? Because there's two boys in particular that are mentioned in this scene. The first one is Roger. And it says that Roger ran around the heap of boys and was prodding with his spear whenever uh, pig flesh appeared. So Roger's running around the heap, and anytime he sees an opening, he just stabs. Okay, so he's just going all the way around, just stabbing, stabbing, stabbing. And then it says Jack was on top of the sow, and he was um, stabbing downward with his knife. Okay, so you've got like everybody's just attacking at once. And it says Roger found a lodgment for his point. So he finds one particular spot for his spear and he just starts pushing. And it says, if you look, he, he pushed until he was leaning his whole weight on the spear and the spear moved forward inch by inch and the terrified squealing became a high pitched scream. Okay, and then Jack found the throat and the hot blood spouted over his hands and the sow collapsed under them and they were heavy and fulfilled upon her. And that phrasing too is also um, interesting. So do you see like what these two boys do? It's very savage, okay? And Roger is the one who is sort of, in my mind, the more savage compared to Jack. I mean, Jack ended her life, but before he's able to do that, Roger literally starts at one end of the pig and he just pushes until it's all the way through her and she's still alive. So he skewers her alive. And that's pretty violent. Okay? Do you guys understand that? Thus the reason why at the bottom of page 135, the very interesting phrase, did you see the interesting phrase at the bottom of 135? 
Yeah. We can see. Yeah. That's why <laughs> that's, why, that's why Robert says that. Because when like after they kill her and they all step back, nobody realized what Roger had done. And then when they see it, they're like, Oh my gosh. And then that's what he says to like make it a joke. Okay? So very, very violent scene, super violent. Okay, so that's that one. Um, and then so now let's look at Jack, right? This, this is like deja vu for us, is it not? Look at the bottom of 135. It says, Jack stood up, holding out his hands, and they're covered with blood. Do you remember when he did that in chapter four? Remember? How did he react when he saw the blood on his hands? Josh. He was like, Ugh. and he quickly wiped them off and cleaned them off in his shorts. What does he do on page 135 this time? How do we see a, cha a change? In Jack, what does he do? Yes, he like he's looking. He goes look, and it says he giggled and flipped them, and then he went over to Maurice and grabbed his face and rubbed the stuff all over his cheeks, and they laughed. So now he's not in a hurry to get the blood off of his hands. He loves the blood, and he's rubbing it on the boy's face and he's flicking them and giggling. So let's highlight that because that's definitely important for a change, right? So how about we start with, look, he giggled and flipped them while the boys laughed at his reeking palms. Then Jack grabbed Maurice and rubbed the socks over his cheeks. Yeah. So would you say we're over here at this point? Yes. Yeah. We're probably maybe right there. Yeah. Okay. So he's, he's falling apart. Okay. So now for number six. I mean, yeah, they killed this really big pig, and that's great, but now they have a problem, right? So what's the problem? What's the problem going to be? Uh, they can't get the fire. How are they going to cook it, right? Because who has fire? Who's in control of fire? Yes, because he has what? Piggy specs, and Piggy's on his side, so they don't have a fire. So what does Jack suggest will be their answer to that? We're going to run over to his side, and we're going to steal fire. We're going to paint our faces and sneak up. We're going to steal fire. Okay, so on 136, let's highlight that. It's going to be like right in the middle. Can you find the paragraph that starts with, we'll raid them? Bless you. And take fire. Do you see that paragraph? Highlight the whole thing. Right here. We'll take them and raid, or we'll, we'll raid them and take fire. There must be four of you, Henry, you, Robert, and Maurice. We'll put on paint, sneak up. Roger can snatch a branch while I say what I want. The rest of you can get this back to where we were. We'll build the fire there. And after that, and what's his idea that he has next? No. First up? Melanie, go ahead. Yes, and he leaves the head. So if it wasn't bad enough what he did to this poor pig, then he decides to cut its head off yeah. and spike it on a stick. Okay, so at the right where you left off, can you just read down with me? It says, he paused and stood up, looking at the shadows under the trees. His voice was lower when he spoke again. And he says, but we'll leave part of the kill for, he knelt down again and was busy with his knife. The boys crowded around him. He spoke over his shoulder to Roger. And you're going to highlight right here, sharpen a stick at both ends. And then highlight, presently he stood up holding the dripping sow's head in his hands. Where's that stick? Stop right there. That will be important later in the book. So they sharpen a stick at both ends. So it has two points, okay, one on either side. They jam the one end in the earth. Jack comes over. He puts the head down on the other side. And they leave it upright like that. And it just happens to be standing right in front of Simon's little doorway, and it's like looking at him. And then they, they say, he says, this head is for the beast. It is a gift. And he says it like to the forest, and then they all back away. And then that scene ends. Okay? Very savage. So do you understand that like leaving this kill, this part of the kill, is sort of like a sacrifice offering, or like a peace offering? In the ancient civilizations, they would do that. They would like sacrifice an animal on the altar and they would do that to appease the gods. It's very savage. So that's what he's doing. And then he, they leave. Okay. 
okay? Now, poor little Simon, he witnessed all of this, and he's like, doesn't like violence. And so on 137, he's sort of looking at it, and he can't get it out of his mind. Even when he closes his eyes, he can still see the head. And he thinks that it's smiling at him at first, grinning at him. And then he thinks that it's starting to talk to him. And it's saying things like, and I'm at the bottom of 137 in the second to last paragraph, it says, a gift for the beast, might not the beast come for it? The head, he thought, appeared to agree with him. Run away, said the head silently. Go back to the others. It was just a joke, really. Why should you bother? You were just wrong, that's all. What does that mean? What is this thing claiming that Simon was wrong about? He says, you were just wrong, that's all. What do you think he means? Yes, about the beast, right? Because Simon's the only boy that doesn't believe in the beast. And he's starting to feel like the thing is trying to convince him otherwise. Like, you were just wrong. There is a beast. Okay? And so, bottom of 137, Lucy is where we get the description of the clouds coming. Okay? Go to 138. On page 138, we get the first references to flies. And we also get the meaning behind the title. Did you catch on to that? Because the title is mentioned. So at, at the top of 138, it says, even the butterflies deserted the open space. So the butterflies leave. Mm -hmm. um, but it says, Simon lowered his head, carefully keeping his eyes shut, then sheltered them with his hand. There were no shadows under the trees, but everywhere where was a pearly uh, stillness, so that the what was real seemed elusive and without definition. And here's our first highlight. The pile of guts was a black blob of flies that buzzed like a saw. And you can just pause there. Keep reading. After a while, these flies found Simon. Gorged, they alighted by his runnels of sweat and drank. They tickled under his nostrils and played leapfrog on his thighs. And you're going to highlight right here. They were black and iridescent green and without number. And in front of Simon, the lord of the flies hung on his stick and grinned. You understand why there's like thousands of flies congregating? at one time, right? Why? Why? Yeah. It's like, it's it's fresh flesh. And yeah, like, yeah, that's hard to say. Say that three times. Fresh flesh. Fresh flesh. Fresh flesh. That's hard to say. That's good to um, Yeah, I mean, Mrs. Smoothie said, like, have you ever seen, like, roadkill on the side of the road or, like, when a deer dies? And, like, they leave it there for a long time. It, like, decomposes, like gets, right? Yeah. So think about the link. Can anybody make the connection between the boys and the flies? You can? Wait. Um, well, I, I said that the chief is like the pigs are the fish, or like the lord, and then the flies are like obeying the lord, and they're all like together, and they're all being savage. Okay. Luke? I thought like the pig had just showed the pig and the flies was all the boys like attacking it. Well, yeah, and what do flies do? Because obviously flies are flies have a job. Well. They have a job. They what do they do? They, they decompose. They break things down and eat them away. Now guys, think about this. When the island was, like, at the beginning of the book, the island was a deserted, uninhabited island, right? So uninhabited means that nobody has ever stepped foot on it. So it was a gorgeous, tropical paradise that had been untouched. Since the boys have arrived, what destruction have they caused? What, what decompose, like, what are they doing to the island? What are they doing, Elliot? They're killing plants, they're killing pigs. Uh, they, they, they defecated everywhere. They burned, they burned a whole section of it down. <laughs> they were throwing boulders off of the top of Castle Rock. So do you see how like the fly, you could make a connection that the flies are like the boys? The flies decompose and break things and eat them away. And ever since these boys have arrived, they've been destroying this island, right? They've been wrecking it. Okay, so there's a strong connection and correlation between that. Um, so then, and you can see like, it's almost like this pig's head is like the master of all the flies. Like, it is like the, the Lord. And that's where this sort of symbol comes from. And also, 
the most evil boy on the island has created it. Did you catch on to that? Mm -hmm. Jack, he creates this thing. And that means something, okay? All right, questions about the kill scene, questions about any of that before we move? You guys okay? Everybody's feeling okay? Okay. <laughs> All right, on 139, you get the, the answer to question eight. So the scene shifts and we go back to um, the beach. And the only boys that are really there are the twins, Sam and Eric, Ralph, and Peggy, and some of the little boys. And so Ralph is feeling really dejected, and he admits two things, almost three things, to Peggy on this page. So what do, what do we got? What's one? I said that he tells Peggy he's scared, and they might die on the island. Yeah, so he's scared. And he's, first he says, not of the beast. Well, I mean, I'm scared of that too, but, and he's like, you know, rambling. What else does he say? Uh, yeah, that the, the island's getting worse and worse. And he does say something about the fire, I believe. Something he's scared about. He's scared that he's going to forget about it because like Jack. Yeah, like he's he's scared that the that the boys don't understand about the fire, but then also that he might become like them and he might forget about the fire. And he says, what will become of us if I forget about the fire and I don't care anymore? Okay, so that's on 139. And it's like right in the middle of 139. Do you see where he says, I'm scared? Mm -hmm. Highlight. I'm scared. He saw Piggy look up and blundered on. Not of the beast. I mean, I'm scared of that too, but nobody else understands about the fire. And if someone threw you a rope when you were drowning, and if a doctor said, take this because you didn't, if you don't, you'll die, you would, wouldn't you? And then if you drop down, you can highlight. Can't they see? Can't they understand? Without a smoke signal, we'll die here. Okay, so he understands, like, this is life or death, okay? All right, so as they're talking on page 140, Jack and his tribe arrive. And what do they look like? This is on 140. There's a paragraph that starts with the forest near them. And what does it tell you in that paragraph? What does it call them? These boys that arrive, Abby. Demonic figures, like like possessed with like you know demons. Yes. And how do they look? Howling. So they're all painted. So now, if you're part of Jack's group, you are painted. And they're like screaming, and they come flying in, and everybody scatters. And two boys walk, run over to the fire and grab branches, okay? Why don't you put a box around that whole paragraph, and then the very last line says, the three others stood still watching Ralph, and he saw that the tallest of them, stark naked, except for paint and a belt, was Jack. So Jack doesn't only have his face painted anymore. His whole body. He's not wearing any clothes. He's just wearing a belt with a knife. No pants. No pants. Naked. Naked. Okay. So, okay. Savage meter. Before we were just painting our face, now we're painting our whole body. And we have no clothes on except for a knife. Okay. Yeah. Well, at least he has the belt. At least, yeah, at least he has the, the belt. Okay. All right, so that's going to bring us to nine, and I'm going to stop here for today, and we're going to do part two on Monday, and we'll talk about, like, what Jack says and all that, and we'll finish up with that last scene with Simon and the Lord of the Flies and sort of talk about what that means. Bum.